Welcome to Demystifying Science, where we explore the limits of what is known. Today on the show, we have with us Dr. Luis Boitois, who is from the University of Saskatchewan, and he is an acknowledgement, which means that he studies the fossilized interactions of animals and their environments, which means that he is an excellent resource for us about the Great Unconformity, which we just released a video about, and we actually came across Dr. Boitois' work while we were researching about this, because he was on a paper that discussed the continuity of the fossil record across the Idiocaran and Cambrian boundary, which obviously doesn't necessarily line up with the idea of a terrible planet-wide catastrophic event that happened during this period. And so... We have him here today to tell us a little bit more about what the Earth was like at this great juncture, and to even tell us a little bit more about the juncture, because he himself has studied the sort of the planetary nature of the Great Unconformity. So welcome, Dr. Boitois. Hello. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. So my first question is about the Great Unconformity. Is it truly a planet-wide line in the fossil record? I would say it's a very important unconformity, probably one of the most important ones that have been described in the in the stratigraphic record. Um, it's quite developed in the cratonic area of North America, where it was originally described, I mean, very well exposed in the, in the Grand Canyon, for example. But I would say that depending where you go, you will find kind of a different expression of the unconformity uh, the time span involved may be quite uh, reduced. Um, this is happening in many different places and even in other areas in North America, uh, like the Death Valley, for example. Can we back this up real quick and just explain what an unconformity is for people who are just getting into this and haven't seen our, our latest movie and stuff like that? Yes, I mean, uh, when you look at the stratigraphic record, at some point, you realize that there is no continuity in the sedimentary succession. What you may have is gaps of kind of different scale. Uh, The most dramatic ones will be angular unconformities. In the case of an angular unconformity, what you have, it's essentially layers that are older, that are steeply inclined, and in contrast, above the unconformity, you have other layers that have lower angle of inclination. What that means in geologic terms is that that's, yeah, precisely like that. So what means in geologic terms is what we have is at some point in Earth history, there has been tectonic activity, there has been uplift, tilting of the rocks, and then subsequent to that, you have denudation, erosion, and then renew the position. So the, that, that's kind of the most, uh, in, uh, the most dramatic, I would say, type of unconformities, and we call angular unconformities, and are necessarily tectonic in origin. Perfect. Uh, so that's a very common, that's a kind of, that's common. There's common unconformities all over the place. But yes. this, this great unconformity, what, what's up with that? The thing with the great unconformity and where it has been originally described, I mean, the time gap is huge. It's one billion years. So it's, it's quite impressive. Uh, so then you have other kind of unconformities. There a smaller scale. And then you have some that may not have been necessarily involved tectonics. For example, let's suppose that you have uh, layers that are accumulated in shallow marine environment under a few tens of meters of water depth or at sea level. And at some point there is a fall in sea level. When that happens, there is a lot of erosion because those layers that were originally deposited below the seawater, the surface of the, of the marine uh, environment, now they have been eroded. And uh, so there is a lot of uh, sediment that is being removed by the action of physical processes. And then as soon as you have a sea level rise after that, you renew the position. Mm-hmm. So what I see when I look at the time of the great unconformity is in some places you have the great unconformity, you know, and there is a huge gap. But then, depending where you go, you may see that the unconformity is there, but it's just of minor scale. And in other places, you see continuity. And you may see that the the Acaran Cambrian boundary, which is the big thing, uh, uh, it's sometimes is right below 
a minor scale and conformity, sometimes it's a bow, and in other cases it's right, probably uh, coincident with an unconformity. But the thing is that the difference that I see with the notion of the greater conformity is that the scale of the time missing may be really quite small in comparison with what we see in the Grand Canyon, for mm. example. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So less rock has been removed at some places than other places. Yes. For example, one of the places that, I, that I've been is Namibia. There's been a lot of work done, done in that area. Um, when you go to Namibia, one of the good things is there have been a lot of um, improvement in the dating of the rocks. And in fact, you know, the, the usually geologists, we, there is something called the International Commission on Stratigraphy, which is the, the commission that studied the boundaries. Right now, the boundary between the Diakar and Cambrian is located at 541 million years ago. Okay. And what is that defined by? What is this boundary defined by? The types of uh, creatures it's, that you see traces yes, of? It's actually, that's quite interesting because you usually define the boundaries in the sort of the Phanerozoi, which is the, all those rocks that go from the Cambrian to the recent. You pretty much define that on the base of body fossils, let's say maybe shells, uh, maybe like trilobites, or maybe some other organisms like graptolites that were floating in the water column. In the case of the Diakar and Cambrian boundary, is defined on the basis of a trace fossil. Mm -hmm. So, which kind of sounds unusual, because why are you going to use a trace fossil rather than a body fossil? And the answer is, there were not a lot, a lot of things going around at that time. So, the, the appearance of a specific trace fossil that is called Treptinus pidum, which is a branching burrow, most likely produced by a kind of worm called priapulid, that you may have them today. Hmm? So uh, what the spirit of placing the boundary at that time, based on that specific trace fossil, is to recognize that it's a time of evolutionary innovations. So prior to the boundary, there were very few organisms that were able to actually penetrate into the sediment. And now what we have is the appearance of this specific animal that we call an infaunal organism, which means it's able to get into the sediment. And it's starting to prove, make proofs, and those kind of very systematic branching burrows. So that's the idea that the, the the base of the Cambrian is placed with when we have the first appearance of this trace fossil, which has been controversial. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people don't like that idea, uh, but it's it's kind of in the spirit of saying, look, there is something that is changing in terms of what animals are able to do, uh, the way the animals are able to interact with the sediment, and that's the reason we are placing at the boundary after the first appearance of a trace fossil rather than a body fossil. But it's not that there weren't organisms on the on the planet before this. It's just that there's some sort of shift in the way that the organisms are are interacting with their environment. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, if you go and you take a look at the uh, Yakan, and particularly the last several million years of the Yakan, what we usually call the terminal Yakan, I mean, clearly there, there were other animals that were making trace fossils, uh, and you see them, but they tend to be rather superficial. So what you see is surfaces that have been stabilized by microbial activity, and then you see tiny animals moving at the surface or a little bit below the surface doing those little trails that we call grazing trails. They are feeding and moving. They were probably feeding from the microbial mat. These changes, okay, they are kind of gradual because even in Namibia, when you go and you look at the last million years or so before the boundary, you start seeing animals that are pretty much more modern in their appearance in terms of the trace fossils that they produce. So and that's one of the complications for the boundary. And is the idea well, that they, their, their bodies had to have changed in some radical way to allow them to penetrate to these great, greater depths? That or the environment changed around them in such a way that the this, this stuff at the bottom of the ocean was different? Like, what is the... Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a big, <laughs> a big point. I mean, what's coming first? Hmm? And here is the whole discussion on, on the origin of the Cambrian explosion 
that there have been two sets of interpretations. One is environmental, so something changed in the environment, so this happened. The other is more intrinsic. So there is something going on in terms of development of organisms that uh, produce that trend, that change. So in one case, it's extrinsic, it's the environment that is producing something. In the other case, it's something that is specific of the organisms. So, um, and what are those factors? Like, what, what would change in the organism to allow it to dig deeper? And what would change in the environment to allow it to... It's the, the, I would say it's the development of some sort of internal cavity that mm. allows the animal to penetrate into the substrate. And they are kind of different, in, if, if you think, environmental triggers of that. Oxygen is, is one classic candidate. So there has been an increase in oxygenation. So this is considered by, by the end of the diagram. And this has considered to enable organisms to, to, to develop um, it's considered like one of the factors that may have not triggered the Cambrian explosion because it's not so, as simple as that. There is not cost-effect relationship. There is a multiplicity of factors, but at least have provided the adequate environmental conditions for animals to be able to actually start burrowing down. But from what I from what I understand, though, the the types of body plans and the appearance of the animals across this boundary is pretty radically different before and after. So when you look at these fossils, do you see a a sort of a reasonable progression where you're like, okay, so at this point they looked like this, and then they shifted to look like this, and then they shifted a little bit more, and we have this very, very gradual change? Or does it appear more as we have a bin of creatures that look one way, and then they look totally different on the other side of the boundary? Yeah, that, it, it's, that's a very good point, because, I mean, one of the things that happened is... Let's think in terms of what actually the original meaning of the Cambrian explosion is and has been defined based on body fossils. So pretty much what happened is at some point, not precisely at the boundary between the Diacan and the Cambrian, but a little bit later during the early Cambrian, what we may say the second half of the early Cambrian. Um, when that, at, at that point, what we see is the appearance of shells, uh, body fossils, so, um, and, and, and also soft-bodied organisms of exceptional preservation, you know, the, the what we call the Burgess shale type. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the, the idea of the Cambrian explosion is directly associated with body fossils, not with trace fossils. And that explosion in body fossils is taking place during the second half of the early Cambrian. And then it continues. I mean, Burgess shale is middle Cambrian in age. The, 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 the precise locality in the Canadian Rockies. But the interesting point is what happened when you look at the trace fossils? And the trace fossils are quite interesting in that regard because they have a, there is a continuity. You have a record that goes all the way from the uh, second half of the, the Acheron all the way into the second half of the early Cambrian, if you wish. So there is, there is some time in between the last uh, occurrences of Ediacaran body fossils and the early occurrences of Cambrian body fossils, there is a gap, which is a kind of uh, interesting gap, some uh, 20 million years uh, or something, that you don't actually have body fossils, but you do have the trace fossils. So that sort of progression, mm, it's... Uh, when you look at the trace fossils, you see a little bit of that progression because, for example, let's have a specific case, Treptignus. Okay. We know what we call Treptignus, Pirum appears for the first time at the base of the Cambrian. Okay. However, when you start looking at the terminal Ediacaran, you look at the rocks and you see little proofs getting into the sediment certain sort of branches that are not as sophisticated as the ones that are associated with Treptinus pedon, but you have them. So you know there is, an there is an animal that is burrowing and producing some trace fossils that are on the way of becoming mm. Treptinus pedon. Then there is another interesting trace, it's less well known than um, than Tractinus pedum, that is called Samignitis. Samignitis is not a branching burrow, it's a it's kind of a trail, it's within the sediment, 
it's horizontal and it has some very specific back field and it's large, it's real large, really large. They may be a couple of centimeters wide, mm. which is quite impressive. So that's quite common in the early Cambrian. Well, if you go to Namibia and you look at some of the rocks right before the boundary, you see a, a trace fossil that has some similarities with Samignites. We, we call it parasamignites in an, in an early paper because it wasn't precisely identical to Samignites. It was something different. So you get this continuity. Okay, and that's what we like to call the roots of the Cambrian explosion. Um, it's all this idea, uh, the notion of explosion, some people do not like that notion because it, it, it sounds like something coming out of nowhere. So it's this idea of the of the fuse, which was the fuse uh, for the explosion. But if the worms are continuous across, the, so if, you, if these burrows are continuous across the boundary and you see sort of a gradual transition from one to another, but then you have this other body plan and the, the hard bodies that arise, Yes. Where, where, where is the root of the hard body? Do they behave the same way as the worms do and you start seeing like hard worm bodies that is transition? Is it part of the internal cavity appearance? Yeah, well, for example, one, there is one nice example of, uh, of a group of animals that uh, you find in as body fossils and as trace fossils, and those are trilobites. Mm -hmm. you know? Trilobites, they are really very common since the second half of the, uh, the late half of the early Cambrian, they become increasingly common. They dominate Cambrian seas, they dominate Ordovician seas, and they produce a specific type of trace fossils. When they move into the sediment, they move their legs, so they are scratching mm. the surface, and they, they produce some trace fossils that are called Cruciana. Mm. So uh, when you take a look at the earliest Cambrian, there is something interesting, which is prior to the appearance of the first trilobites, you start seeing evidence in the early Cambrian of the scratches that those animals produce with their legs. So you get, you get a sense of the continuity of the, the record. But the interesting point is that the trace fossils, they seem to be a little bit older than the body fossils. Mm. So it's like they had so, legs before they had the shells, perhaps. Or, yeah, they didn't, of, or they didn't die in the water. Well, that, I mean, those are the two possibilities. I mean, can we have, yeah, they may have been arthropods without uh, having hard parts, uh, may not have been trilobites, but other type of trilobite, other type of arthropods, so that's a possibility. And then there's always a possibility of uh, the lack of preservation. Um, so those are the two, but, I saw this, uh, I saw a little blog just somewhat related on your website that you were sort of, there was some uh, evidence that perhaps trilobites weren't entirely a marine species as they're traditionally uh, yes. thought. Yes, uh, that's, a, yeah, that's an, uh, it's an interesting idea. Um, what we did uh, is we were, we did field work in Norway, Argentina. Um, there, what you have, it's a series of estuarine deposits. And when you do your, 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 you look at the paleo environments, you, you look at the different layers of rocks and you try to make an environmental interpretation, then you get more or less a sense of where you are in the system. Is it in the outer part of the estuary? Is it in the middle part? Is it in the inner part? And why is this important? Because this, the stress factors are completely different. For an animal to live in the outermost part of an estuary, well, it's almost normal marine salinity conditions. But if you have to move upstream, you have to deal with uh, an increase in salinity stress because the water gets fresher and fresher. Mm? So it's, it's, it's no normal marine anymore. It gets brackish water. Mm? Um, so what we know this is because we have several of those formations of estuaries, at least four, that if you move, and this is, these are younger rocks, are so late Cambrian all the way into the middle Ordovician. So we are moving a little bit further uh, uh, in time, uh, closer to the present. So we know this, that trilobites were able to explore progressively more inland position. Uh, fresh water, we don't have any evidence of fresh water. What we, what we do think is that they were able to tolerate increasingly brackish conditions. So we, they were moving upstream, probably they were not living there. They were exploring and going back. 
into the into the uh, uh, open sea. But the the interesting point of that is that it's it's showing you that the some animals that are in this case they are the archetypal animals of the Cambrian explosion, they were able to colonize environments that were not strictly fully marine. So it gives you an idea of the expansion of the Cambrian explosion, which is another, another interesting topic, uh, because for the most part, we know it was happening in shallow waters. So and that's, it depends of meters. Yeah, and that's kind of the, the question there, which is how, uh, how much is lost because of the conditions in which fossils are made. So if you need shallow water or watery environments in order to form fossils, are there things on land that are happening that we just have no record of? Well, the, the, the environmental control is huge. Um, the, for, for example, uh, you need certain conditions for the animals to be able to colonize. Uh, I will give you one example. There is one spectacular place to look at the terminal at Yakaran and the beginning of the Cambrian is Oman. Oman is mm. quite impressive for a number of reasons. Uh, there is not a lot of structural deformation, particularly when you go to the areas that are now in the modern desert. There is no vegetation, so it's all outcrop. So you can see a lot in terms of outcrop. For, for the geologists, it's a paradise. However, when you get closer to the boundary, you start seeing evaporites. So the environment is something similar to what maybe now the Persian Gulf, a sort of a sabka, a setting where you have a lot of evaporation. Um, it's the opposite problem to what we have talked before. Here is too much salt in the water. So it's hypersaline. So you look at those deposits, there are no trace fossils. Does it mean that it was because there were no organisms alive at the time? No, we know that in other places in the world they have been, but this the environment is not right. I mean, it was so stressful that they were unable to colonize those settings that were hypersaline. So that would be a problem. Then is the issue that you mentioned, the continents. Was there life in the continents or not? So far, what we think is that for a long, long time, we have uh, microbial activity, um, fungi, um, but essentially not, not animals. Mm, what we have, the, the closer that we get to have uh, evidence of animals on land is there are some lower Cambrian rocks in Eastern United States and in Eastern Canada that they are Aeolian dunes. You know, when you, when you go, for example, today, uh, you go, and you, you are down the sea, sometimes you have Aeolian dunes that are formed outside those marine environments. So there are some rocks that are recording those environments and they are trackways. So the, the idea is that there were some group of arthropods that were able to walk on the dunes outside the water, so in a terrestrial setting, but they were not living there, they were coming back to the ocean. Mm. And then we have to wait all the Cambrian, apparently, and most likely all the Ordovician until by the Silurian, so what we call the Middle Paleozoic, we start seeing evidence of trace fossils in continental environments that are showing us, okay, there were animals living here at this point. And, and that's, about a, uh, sorry, that's about 100 million years from yes. the point where you start to see the uh, yeah, trypt Tryptidus pinus? Yes, yes, Tryptidus uh, pidum, yes. Pidum. So, yes, there is a yeah, there is a huge, what we call a macroevolutionary lag. So a time in between events. So the colonization of the continents took much, much later than the marine environment. And is that when the plants showed up too? The plants, it's, uh, there is kind of a debate, but we know that by the middle of the Ordovician, for sure, we have the first land plants. So the, 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 the colonization pattern will be first the land plants, then the invertebrates, and much later the vertebrates. So the first tetrapods that were able to walk on land is most likely around the middle Devonian. So we are we keep on moving. So the colonization of the land was a very protracted process. It took and millions and millions of years. But it's and it's interesting that it seems to involve the plants and the animals like at the same time. Like you don't have uh, this long stretch of time with plants without animals. 
Well, I can imagine that if there's is are there plants in the water first, and then they like are there are seaweeds and algaes and yes, yes. and and even the idea is that the first land plants they originate originated for a group of um, uh, called carophytes that were were a, were probably living in in, in fresh waters ponds and things like that and apparently the first land plants they originated from them so you see sort of progression yeah but definitely that were first you have algae in in marine environments so this brings us to the the question of the great unconformity quite neatly because the great unconformity is 500 million years or more of missing time that would have erased any record of what was happening on land at this time Yes. And so is it possible that there's a piece of the geologic record that was just deleted where this was actually happening much earlier, but there's no trace left of it? Or is that... I, I would say that that's possible in, in, in spots, in certain spots. Okay. So because a little bit this work is like putting together the pieces of a puzzle. So, but the problem is... Those pieces, when you are, we are, when you are working with a puzzle, you know that all the pieces are on the table. <laughs> here, here is this is not the case. You have to go all over the world looking for the pieces, and there is always a possibility there is one piece that is missing forever. We simply don't know. I mean, we keep on exploring. So I would say, for example, if you go to the Grand Canyon, yes, I mean, definitely, you are completely lost. There is nothing you can say about that transition simply because the rocks are not there. But then the thing is, okay, where do I go? Um, and as I said, you, you may go to, to Namibia, you may go to Newfoundland, um, where the type of locality for the base of the Cambrian is defined. There you have a sort of a continuous record, and it's pretty thick, the succession. So you have the possibility of, of doing a very detailed work, and you have many different environments preserved in rocks of different ages. So you can say, okay, I'm going to take a look at, let's assume that this interval of the succession was format, you know, 50 or 60 meters of water depth, then I have to look for a similar environment above, mm. younger. So I'm able to actually make comparisons of rocks formed in similar environments, but of different age. And that's quite important because you kind of isolate the problem of the environmental control. Why, do you, why was Namibia spared from whatever eroded a, or, or removed the rock from Grand Canyon or other places. Or, and even Newfoundland, right? In Asia? Or? Yes. Yeah, they are, they are in areas that uh, they, they, they have not been before. I mean, it's um, uh, the tectonic settings are, are different. Um, Namibia, for example, was what we call a fallen basin. It was formed up from um, uh, um, a rising orogenic belt. Uh, but it's now in a cratonic area, has not been deformed. There are a lot of areas in, in, in Africa where you have that. Uh, another example would be South Africa, uh, the, that you have a quite continuous succession. The problem of South Africa is that you don't have body fossils and you don't have um, direct evidence of the age. So you are a little bit lost in terms of the age. Namibia is much better in that regards. Um, so you're saying Namibia was in a different, it was somewhere else. Did, are you saying that it was like at the bottom of the ocean or something like that? Uh, yeah, yes. So I, it was spared from say, whatever, whatever, I, well, like, say, say like the conventional uh, idea of like a snowball earth type situation. Would Namibia have been spared from that because it was at such low elevation or something? Or? Uh, no, actually, it's quite interesting because Namibia uh, has excellent records of the snowball earth uh, deposits and actually was one of the classic localities hmm. uh, where you have spectacular diamictites. Uh, I mean, those rocks, those um, very coarse grained rocks, poorly sorted with uh, sort of the muddy matrix that they are showing you that they were transported by glaciers, the kind of things that you that you look when you look at the last age in the Pleistocene. So there are spectacular outcrops of that uh, that mark a period called the Cryogenian, which is the one right below the Idiacara. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's one of the localities where you see that Oman has an impressive record of this noble earth deposits. Uh, I remember I was there with a group of people. We were standing at the top of the mountain in one of the areas of the Oman mountains. And you look below and all this slope, you have, you see 
hundreds and hundreds of meters of glacial deposits that are of cryogenian age. So quite impressive, the scale of that. And on top of that, you get the diagram. But that's that, that's the interesting thing about the cryogenian is that it precedes the idiacrin. And yes. so if you look at something like the Grand... So for me, it seems like the snowball earth that happened during the cryogenian is not at the right time for the idiacrin cambrian boundary to be erased. It happened previously and... It's previous. Yes, yes. It's it's previous because what what you have is that the end of the cryogenian is six hundred thirty five million years, so mm-hmm. that will be the cryogenian Ediacaran boundary. Mm-hmm. But for example, if you think in terms of the Grand Canyon, I mean the 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 rocks of the the, the of the time of the Snowball Earth are gone as well, because there is a lot of missing time there. But this an it's it's a it's um. An event that is preceding the diacaran. And actually, if you look at the sort of the stratigraphy, it's cryogenian diacaran on top. And then you have problems, obviously, to make uh, finer grain subdivisions, you know, because you don't have a lot of fossils. So that's one of the, the, the problems, for example, to make subdivisions in the diacaran to get a more precise temporal framework. But it's prior to the rise of. Um, of the diacaran biota, which the oldest ones, the oldest representatives of the diacaran body fossils, okay, uh, which are still of uncertain uh, um, affinities in terms of what they are, you have them in Newfoundland. And in Newfoundland, you can do, you can actually walk from um, in areas where you have deposits with the with the, um, uh, all this diacaran, and even you have uh, areas where you have uh, evidence of the snowball earth, and then you can start walking stratigraphically up into what they are kind of the oldest, some of the oldest diagram rocks, and you start seeing the appearance of uh, body fossils culminating in that classic place that is called Mistaken Point, where it's a spectacular series of surfaces that they are, they have preserved fantastic body fossils. And they have really studied with a lot they have been studied with a lot of detail so that will be what coming after the snowball earth but the the but, great unconformity is so if you if you were to go and look at you know the pop science presentations on the great unconformity yeah. Yeah. it's it's linked directly to snowball earth and it doesn't totally make sense because the the missing time extends like you said it does extend into the, the snowball oh. earth period, but it continues far beyond that by almost like a hundred million years. Uh, what, At least in the Grand Canyon. I don't know how it is in other yeah, places. Yeah, the, well, 1,000, uh, yes. Um, but then, and it's even, it, it gets even there, even at times uh, of uh, a gap that it goes all the way into the Cambrian, because there are some areas where you have late Cambrian deposits on top of the unconformity. So it's a much wider uh, temporal uh, range involved. I mean, the gap is much higher, uh, much longer. Mm-hmm. So, and that's one of the, the, the points. I mean, when, when you try to explain the Cambrian explosion, it has, you have to go to one of those localities where that time is, pre- that time is, is actually preserving rocks. Um, because there you can say, okay, once I, I have located the boundary, which is not an easy thing because as I said, there are very few fossils. You relied on a trace fossils. There are some localities with dates, with absolute dates, some localities that do not have dates. But once you have located that, then you do a, a, a much more detailed scale stratigraphy. Uh, for example, again, if we think in terms of uh, uh, Namibia, there is, a, there is an unconformity which is apparently, there is still an argument, but there is apparently above the the Acheron Cambrian boundary. For a long time, it was considered that it was at the boundary itself. Now we think it was probably above, and it's actually two unconformities. Hmm. But they are conformities of very smaller scale because they are related with that second type of unconformities that I was talking about. There was a falling sea level there was an incision, there was erosion, an incision of paleobalids that they were infilled 
during the subsequent rise in sea level. And that actually happened twice. If you go there, you, you, you walk stratigraphically up section, and at some point you cross the boundary, and at some point you see one of those valleys is in fill and another one. And when you actually try to estimate how long did it take, it's less than, a, it's around half a million year between the, the days that we have below the boundary and uh, uh, right above those valleys. So those are unconformities that are of much smaller temporal scale and they have a different origin. So the good thing for, for someone who, are, who is trying to provide some sort of reconstruction of those environments is that, well, those are the, the, the places where you have a more continuous record. So you can go there and actually do a very detailed analysis, layer by layer. You try to search for body fossils, try to search for trace fossils, and then you get a much better idea of the chronology of events, mm -hmm. which is one of the big things. Because, I mean, one of the, the first things that you need to, to get right, or as right as possible, is uh, the chronology. What's happened first? What's coming next? Uh, that was that was actually my question. So you said something very interesting about that you have absolute dates for not that many of these layers. So it's not like you can show up and just collect sample samples from each layer and date it. Why is that? Because you need a specific type of of uh, deposits to to be able to do that. Uh, what what it's basically doing you need you need some ash layers, some volcanic eruptions. There you have zircons that you can actually date. And there is a lot of work done by geochronologists. So, uh, but for example, if you think uh, Newfoundland in the in the area of the Precambrian Cambrian boundary, we don't have absolute dates, and that has always been an issue. So the the boundary is placed on the appearance of Tertignus pedum. Um, why in Namibia you have those dates? So, uh, but actually, there are many places in the world that you don't have uh, precise dating of the rocks, and this is a this is a big problem. And if you don't get um, the right rocks, well, probably we will not be able to date those, at, at least with the available techniques that we have right now. So, they, and then, then, then it, that's, it's introducing a second problem, is how do we work? I mean, you go, you go to a place and you do the, that detailed analysis, but at some point, you need to establish a correlation between what you see there with another place in the world. And when you don't have those absolute dates, it's really difficult to do the correlation. And that's the reason there's been so much uh, controversy about uh, using Treptignus pedum, because some people would say, well, it's, it's, there are issues with that, it may be controlled by phases and all that. But actually... Does, does, this, yeah. does, the, the, does trep Treptignus pedum ar arise all over the world? Yeah, it has. It's, it's quite. I, I I tend to like the idea of having it at the at the at, as a in the fossil index for the boundary, for a number of reasons. You have it in many different places. You have it, for example, in in Newfoundland, in Western United States. It's in South Africa, Namibia, China, uh, Mongolia. So it's. How's that many possible? It's a very rapid. That's quite impressive. It's very rapid. It's sort of cosmopolitan form, <laughs> but it, it, it moved really very rapidly. And the other thing is, although people say, well, you know, trace fossils, they are, they are constrained by the type of environment. They are not in any different environment. Well, what, what I have seen and the, the work that we have done, we are showing that, you know, when, when you're looking into shallow water, which is, which is what we are talking about, because in the, in the deep seas, it's very difficult. You have deep marine rocks of that age, they are very difficult to, to find fossils. Um, um, when you look at shallow marine environments, Treptinus, Pidum, is present all across the depositional profile, even in some areas that are intertidal between the, the, the low and high tide rocks that were formed in those environments, it's preserved. So it has a very, it had a very high environmental tolerance, which it's very good. It's a very good thing for for uh, for index fossils because what you need it's it's a kind of fossil that is going to have a global distribution and it's not going to be extremely restricted to a specific environment. Do you do you think that 
the burrow do you think that the creature that created the burrow was the same in each place it was lots of different creatures that created the same burrow yeah that that's a it's it's a it's a good point and we always struggle with that um what i would say is there is it's a group of animals uh, most likely priapulid worms uh, that evolved very rapidly at that time and they have a very global distribution. Uh, we cannot say, okay, it's just one species or more than one species, but definitely what we may say, it's a group of phylogenetically related creatures. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, and that's a reason you have them all over. Mm -hmm. It's not probably that it's, okay, it's one type of organism that is doing it, one species of rep. No, it's probably more than one species, but they are all related. I want to go back to Duncan for a moment. I want to as well. Yeah, go for it. I, I'm still trying to understand, uh, from your perspective, what happened at if the unconformity, the great unconformity, is found around the world, but it's spared in certain locations. I'm not sure why those locations were spared yet, unless they're at the bottom of the ocean. And uh, I got sort of sidetracked about the snowball Earth, which it turns out is not even related to the great unconformity. And so now it's, I'm it's back. presented as being related, but so we did a big. We just released a movie. I don't know if you had a chance to see it, but we basically yeah. It took a look. <clears throat> so we propose all these sort of far out possibilities for what erased this rock. How do you think that the same processes erased the rock around the world, or do you think they were different processes? No, I think it was probably different processes because I I think that what's going on is that. What you have is uh, the local tectonics. I mean, you have areas, if you think, for example, uh, today, uh, you, you go to Eastern uh, North America, Eastern South America is what we consider passive margin. Yeah? So if you go to the Pacific margin, it's what we call an active margin. So there is mountain building, tectonic activity, all sorts of things going on. So what happened with with the unconformities, depending depending where you are in terms of tectonics, uh, the end result is going to be different. So I think that there are there have been areas where there was probably not significant tectonic activity, and that's the reason you don't see an angular conformity in uh, I, between I, I, the Akron and the Cambria. I understand that, but my question is like, why why was there less erosion at some places than other places? Um, the, the erosion, it, it's going to be in part related with tectonic uplift. I mean, if you have mountain building, then you will have all the rocks that are, that are moving up because of tectonic uplift, and those have, are going to work as source rocks for other sediments. So because there's going to be a lot of weathering, erosion, and part of that material is going to be distributed into other marine environments. So, but if you are in an area where you don't have tectonic uplift, or what you have is subsidence, which means the bottom of the basin is, is moving down, is sinking, and then it's creating a lot of accommodation for sediment to get preserved, then the record is going to be different. And I think that what happened with the great unconformity is that when we think in terms of something that is of global scale, we may miss the, the, the perspective that, well, it's spectacular when you see in the Grand Canyon, but then you go to other places in the world and you don't really see the same. But you go to other places in the world and you do see the same, right? Uh, yes, but uh, but I would say that, yeah, you see that in, in other places. Uh, but sometimes involving different time spans. Hmm? There are examples in areas of China, um, uh, but then even even in, in 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 the states i mean if you go to death valley um you you get a relatively nice continuous record from the diacran to the cambrian punctuated by a couple of unconformities but they are of local scale and they are related with those times of sea level fall for example something that you see very well in the in nevada for example and in eastern california is you you, you you move stratigraphically upwards, now within the Cambria, um, and you see shallow marine environments, and at some point there are fluvial deposits, fluvial conglomerates resting on top of those marine environments, which means the civil fall. And this is very similar to what we see in Namibia. 
um, so so you, you you get when you look at the specific spots, there is a lot of variability, a lot of variability. Uh, another example in in China, in southern China, in um, in Yunnan province, there is a very well known um, succession that you have the the Akran and Cambrian, and there you have carbonates. Mm-hmm. And what happened with carbonates is that when there is a sea level fall or um, there is a lot of dissolution of the carbonate material, uh, that's, for, that's a reason you have plenty of caves in, in terrains that are made of carbonates. So depending on, on, the, on the dating that has been done, which is essentially based on, on, on fossils, uh, one the surface that is the potential candidate for the Diacaran and Cambrian there it's a surface that has been affected by karst, that dissolution of carbonates. So we know that it was subaerial area exposed, that the sequence that was marine, at some point there was a sea level fall, there was dissolution of the carbonates, formation of karst, and then a transgression on top. But again, when you look at the ages, here we are talking about uh, times that you may solve at the scale of one million years in contrast to the great unconformity. And that's what I was that's that's what I was going to ask which is that a lot of these you know you talk about the sea level rise and fall in Namibia you 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 have these fluvial deposits that are above marine deposits there's lots of places where there's unconformities and it's imaginable that you you lose some number of millions of years. But when you yes. get up to the degree that you're losing a thousand million years yes. it begins to be something that's hard to imagine. As, as not being an enormous catastrophic event. But you seem to think that it's not necessarily a catastrophic event and more just sort of the, the normal process of erosion that just in this one place happens to take down a mountain range. Yeah, I, I, would, I would tend to think, to think that, that you can explain that by um, rational tectonics. And you know, the thing with the, with the, 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 the notion of catastrophic event or things that are, Kind of unactualistic, that in the sense that you cannot apply the principle that says the present is the key to the past. I think this is pretty much since the 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 notion of the impact at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary is pretty much part of the conceptual toolbox of of geologists, and I and I use it quite a lot in in my work. Uh, for example, the idea that when you look at the the the, the sort of shallow marine settings in the diacaran in the absence of biturbators. Uh, you have those all surfaces that have been stabilized by microbial mud, so you cannot actually apply the, the tools of the present to understand that. But in the case of the unconformity, I don't think, I, at least with the information that we have right now, I think that I would probably go for, for, a, for some sort of uh, um, plate tectonics explanation about that because because of the it, it would have been different if that gap would have been at the planetary scale mm. everywhere but because it's not i would tend to think okay it's probably a, you have to look at different tectonic contexts and depending where you are you will have uh, time missing in this but, case but you do have it at several places right is that yes. is that correct? Yes. And then is it possible that the places that were not exposed to that catastrophic event were just underwater? Because it does seem like the Earth had a lot more water, water and a lot less land. Like if you look at the reconstructed maps of the planet as you start to go back into the Neoproterozoic, you have, you know, you have this enormous globe and like a little piddly island basically relative to this water world that it's on. Yeah, well, the distribution of the continents was really quite quite different, um, and that. Uh, but you think that the amount of total land mass that was exposed during this time window was the same as it is now? Like, you think that the land ma- the total land area versus the total ocean area, was equivalent, or no? Well, it it it's, it may have it it should have been quite variable on different time spans mm. because you have times of of. Um, global transgressions where you have broad epicontinental seas, and then if you compare with those times of sea level drop, then uh, it's, it, it, you have much more uh, continental areas exposed. So the, the point with the, with the unconformity is that it's definitely of a huge scale in certain places, and a lot of time missing. So the key point will be, okay, 
why do we have, in, from a tectonics pers perspective, okay, we should have had that area as, as subaya exposed for long periods of times, or what we have had is uh, a series of um, uh, events of uplift and subsidence that uh, we don't have that record preserved in that, in that area. We also don't yeah. see any events happening right now where something like the Himalayan mountains is getting leveled by erosion, right? Because the Himalayas are growing as far as I can tell. Yeah, but you have, uh, it, 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 there is a lot of erosion associated also with, um, with the, the area. Uh, it, it, it's um, sort of working as a source area of some of the big rivers in, in Southeast Asia. So it's, uh, it, 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 it has it, it's been eroded at the same time. And if you look at the if you look at sort of uh, topographic maps of the Indian subcontinent, it's pretty apparent that it is it is a basin that is filled with sediment because you have these huge mountains and then just complete flatlands underneath them, which you look at and you're like, well, this has to be dust from the mountains. Well, one one example is um, the the uh, Ganges uh, Brahma Ganges Brahmaputra River, the delta. And the submarine fan, you know, this is an amazing sedimentary system. Uh, all the rivers that come in, that are coming out from the Himalayas, I mean, they are forming this this delta in the Bay of Bengal. Um, connected to that, there is an incised canyon that is connecting the delta with the submarine fan at hundreds of meters of water depth, and is transporting huge amount of sediment into the deep sea. Uh, so in a way, you can establish a connection between what's going on in the Himalayas with something that is, with sediment that is ending and hundreds of meters of water depth in the Indian Ocean. And the scale of those systems, is, they are absolutely huge. When, they look, when you look at um, the Indian subcontinent, and then you look at the map, you look at the subsurface map of those submarine fans in the Indian Ocean, it's really shocking. You you get a sense of the size of those systems, and the the, the interesting thing is that because this each of these systems has has their own uh, context. In the case of these deep submarine fans, the canyon is not in a far away from the shoreline. It's actually the head of the submarine canyon is at the it's at the sort of the delta front, the sort of the mouth of the Ganges Brahmaputra delta. Hmm. So the material is coming, keeps on coming. You know? And so would you have a similar submarine fan for the Colorado River? That because So as far as I understand about the formation of the West Coast, you have the Pacific Plate, which is being subducted, and yes. it's uh, the the action of the subduction is kind of scraping stuff off of the bottom of the of the Pacific Plate, and it's adding it to the west coast margin of North America. Yes. And so, if you have the Grand Canyon that is formed, and the great unconformity inside the Grand Canyon that's formed through this erosional event of just tectonic uh, uplift leading to mountains which get chewed up, you would expect to find the submarine fan somewhere is is it it has it been located well it, if the imagine that because of the age of the rocks that we have now in the pacific ocean the, the it would have been impossible to find a record of that it should have been there at that time but even with but co with even with like cores find. even with like taking rock cores and looking but, to see how it's distributed through mountains you wouldn't be able to find it no, because all that has been consumed in the in the in the subduction zone. But it should be scraped up onto the western margin of the United States. So you should be go to you should be able to go to a place like Death Valley and be like, oh well, look, because I mean, this is it's not like it's this like huge gap that the plate is just kind of like falling yeah. into, right? Like it's a pretty it's a pretty hefty scrape as far as I can tell. Yeah. And so if you have these two rock layers that are so tightly conjoined that one is getting sucked underneath the other, that if there's a delta fan there, that should end up on the surface somewhere. Yeah, but the point with that, it, it, it's, it's the deformation involved. I mean, the, the further you go back in time into these sort of ancient um, sort of active Martians, the deformation is so intense that you will run into a lot of problems to detect that. And in fact, that's it's one of the issues 
with deep marine uh, deposits of that age that you don't have a lot of that. There are some examples of deep marine deposits of Cambrian age. There are some in, in, in sort of Northwest Canada. There are some in Western Argentina, Northwest Argentina, I would say, where you get, uh, and, they, and they are quite uh, metamorphosed. And they are slates. So they are hard to date, Dif really difficult to date because uh, there, there were no a lot of organisms living there at that time. So you find, you typically go to a place and you find a series of deformed slates and, and you really struggle with that. Mm. Uh, we, we've been, there is some that we have, we have recognized in, in a few spots um, that they have a very peculiar trace fossil that is called Oldamia, which is quite complex, branching burrows, tiny ones, that they are associated with microbial mats. Um, and those are typical of, of deep marine Cambrian deposits. You may find them in shallow marine as well, but typical of deep marine. Is it possible once you have erosion that happens and the rock is weathered to somehow relate the eroded rock to the parent rock? Or is that once you've basically sliced it off, it's... No, you can't. And in, and in fact, there is a lot of work being done right now that they try to look at provenance. So they, they, they try to find the source uh, area based on looking at the material and they use zircons, they use all sorts of uh, materials to do that. Um, it's been quite useful to do tectonic reconstruction. So there is a fair amount of work being done, for example, in Western Canada. Uh, it's, you're, you're looking you are typically looking at much, much younger rocks, but it has a lot of promise that. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that the way to go with these issues is to, the, you need to integrate a lot of lines of evidence. That's kind of the, the that would be my approach to tackle some of these issues of trying to look at the Yakar and Cambrian boundary. So do you think that the, the question of the great unconformity has been conclusively settled? No, I don't think so, because the, 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 the issue with these things is that you, you never have anything that is uh, kind of settled for forever, we, for a number of reasons. Uh, on one hand, uh, we, we keep on making new discoveries, um, and we work at finer and finer scales. So we, we, we will see things that we have not seen before, either because we go back to um, successions that we, 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 we have known for several years, but now we go and work with more detail or because we go to areas that have not been explored. But also what is important is our, our conceptual frameworks change completely. Mm. So, and one of my favorite examples is mass extinctions that we briefly touch on that. Because if you think now, for example, we all agree that the largest mass extinction in the history of the Earth was at the end of the Permian. Okay, so some of the estimation is ninety percent of the species were gone. Well, you know, if you go back in time, thirty years ago, forty years ago, mass extinctions were not a topic. Hmm. I mean, this changed essentially with the discovery of the with the with the proposal of the impact for the for the other extinction, the end Cretaceous one. So our, our way of thinking about things changed completely. So I would say that why things are not settled? Well, on one hand, there is always data that is lucky. You know, you always think, okay, I will find a place where there is a new fossil that is changing things and is going to change what we know about this topic. And on the other hand, our way of looking at things change. Uh, what I've been talking about, this idea of the incised valleys because of sea level fall, that's actually, it's a field that is called sequence stratigraphy that started in the late 80s. You know? So um, it started first as seismic stratigraphy in the 70s. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So those are things, and before that, I mean, we all knew that there were conformities, but we didn't have a very good way of tackling that. So um, yeah, I don't think it's, it's, it's settled by, by any means. And, 
and 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 in the top is and when you go back in time in things Precambrian things there is, there is still a lot of disagreements on, on things and and a lot of debate and controversies and sometimes you see you know set of hypotheses that goes in one direction and then at some point they move mm -hmm. you see that that the, the, that oscillation it's not that they 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 do complete cycles every time there is there are changes. Eh? There, there, is a, there is a sort of direction, if you wish, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of our, our way of, of understanding things. Um, and that's one of the things that happened with the Diakar and Bayota. You know? It was originally, uh, they were all considered as uh, uh, all the representatives of modern groups. Then there was this proposal by Dolf Seilacher, a German paleobiologist, who said, ah, look, uh, no, this, uh, they have nothing to do with modern creatures. They were all related. They are much more related among themselves. And now we are kind of going back to the idea, okay, well, there are some that probably represent the roots of the explosion. But our understanding is growing in that process, I think. And I, I think that that may, may end up happening with the great unconformity as well. And what do you imagine, uh, what direction do you imagine that understanding will grow? Do you have a sense of, of the, of a change that could happen? Yeah, I, 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 I think that it's, pretty, it's, I, I would think it's kind of the integration of different lines of evidence. So I still see that, that when you, when you go and do research on certain topics, we still have kind of compartments, you know. If you are a stratigrapher, you go and you look at certain things. If you are a body fossil paleontologist, you look at something. If you are a trace fossil person, you, you do your thing. Um, Geochemist, they go, take samples, do a geochemical analysis. We still need to do a fine grain in, in integration. And in order to be able to do that, diff, people from different fields, they have to go together to the to the to the field areas to do a very detailed sampling because there are things that they should be solved at certain scale. So if you take a sample from here and another person is coming a few years later taking a sample, from mm -hmm. it, that's a different time. Uh, so there are moves in that direction. There are groups that are increasingly working into um, with, with a more uh, approach to integrate things. Um, from my field, my perspective, from 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 someone doing trace fossils, um, yeah, I would like to see much more people who have looked at trace fossils in younger rocks to get involved with the Precambrian, because one of the problems that we have with the Precambrian is if um, if 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 you only work with rocks of that age um, and you find trace fossils there, you you lose sense of temporal perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason, I mean, my, with my research group, we like to work all along the stratigraphic column because then when you find something in the Precambrian, you say, okay, this is weird. This is not similar to something that happened later. Or, oh yeah, this is something that is the same trace that I have seen uh, in younger rocks. And 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 then you, you avoid the 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 pitfall of thinking okay is oh this is the precarement it has to be something different well no it's not necessarily so so um th that that's from my own perspective of ignorances if if you wish it's it's the, the the idea of making comparisons through time and across different environments because those are the two main variables uh in order to track evolutionary innovation is this something that is controlled by the environment? Is it specific to this uh, environmental setting or is actually reflecting some important evolutionary innovation? Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and I think that it will be also interesting to get people from, even body, people working with body fossils. Um, um, so paleo, paleobiologists uh, with an experience in, in, in younger rocks scene or in modern groups, taking a closer look at uh, Precambrian fossils. And I think that's the case across the board for a lot of sciences, right? You're, a lot you're, of science. Right, you're describing yeah. what is the next, I think, generation of scientific research, which yeah. is that you bring all these people together and you have them put their brains on the same question as opposed to yes. sort of focusing on these 
puncte at different places, which sort of illuminate it, but don't really blend into one. And in a lot of cases, yeah. it seems like there's a whole data science movement behind that, because at least in other branches of science that I'm more familiar with, you have the aggregation, like a mass aggregation of information. And the information piling up faster than people can really rope it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good point. I mean, in, in now in paleobiology, one of the things is to work with large databases. Mm. Uh, so you you actually need to. There is this this tension between okay, I'm going to this place, and I'm going to do a very detailed analysis looking at layer after layer. Well, how does it fit with the big picture? Um, and um, there is um. Smithsonian paleobiologist uh, Doug Erwin, um, he, he, he talked about the, something that he called the uncertainty in principle in paleobiology or something like that. And he says, okay, sometimes you go to a place, you do a very detailed analysis, uh, but you have to be very careful how you are going to extrapolate. And on the other hand, when, when you work with the big data and, and the big picture analysis, you are losing a lot of the details. So you have that kind of... Uh, it's kind of a, it's similar to the uncertainty principle in, 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 in physics, you know. But the thing is, uh, you, you try to do both and you try to move across those scales. Um, but it requires a fair amount of work in different areas, in different geographic areas. Um, when And working with large databases, it requires that you check the data, uh, for example, in what we do. Uh, there are different ways of classifying traces. Uh, so mm -hmm. you need to make sure that if you are going to input a database... <laughs> that uh, somebody isn't crazy who's with, maintained it in the first place. Yeah, you have to do it in a consistent way. Yeah. And it's really, we, we've done, we have done that with, in a couple of uh, projects that we have had. It's really time-consuming because you have to check uh, every every paper and museum collections going to the field but i think that the that's uh those are there are a lot of pro it's a promising line of research are there my my real my last question is kind of are there a lot of people working on this what is the sort of motive force driving this obviously biomedical gets a lot of funding because you know there's diseases that need cured who is paying for geological research? Is it most, mostly petrochemical companies or are, are the state? What is the, yeah, who, how is this being pushed forward? Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a very good question because it's, uh, I would say that uh, there's a big irony here, which is paleontology specifically. It's extremely popular in the, in the, in the media, mostly because of dinosaurs, you know, the <laughs> Jurassic Park effect. Okay. Are you trying to say that the trace fossils don't get as much attention as the dinosaurs? That's strange. Uh, no. <laughs> unless, unless you have dinosaur tracks. Uh, that's yeah, so, but the big irony is that parallel to that attention, and, and you talk with kids and they, they all know what paleontology is and they are excited about it. Uh, the funding is not there. And, in, and it's extremely common that if you think from the perspective of uh, uh, funding agencies or universities, sometimes you may have a geology department, in some cases with one paleontologist, in other cases, not even that. So the funding is it's, it's different from country to country. Um, uh, so probably that's the picture, I would say, in North America and Europe for the most part. Other places different. China is, is uh, providing a lot of funds in paleontology, um, you know, there are so many new sites discover every year in China. And what kind of tactics do you have to take to convince the fun funders that this is important? You know, do you, do you understand? I, like, like I, I, I believe it's, I believe that basic science is valuable just because understanding our world will ultimately lead us to taking better actions in the future. But how do you convince somebody to give you money to, to find this kind of knowledge about the deep past? Yeah, I would say that we have to exploit uh, the uniqueness of our field, which is the notion of deep time. Um, uh, the fact that when you look at things in the present, uh, I would you, you we usually think okay, the present is a key to the past, but actually, 
any historian will say, okay, you know, if we don't understand the past, it's impossible to understand the present. I mean, and, and what applies to history in terms of uh, human history, it also applies to natural sciences. And I think that uh, the, 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 if there is something that geology or paleobiology have to, has to offer is the perspective of deep past. In the deep geologic time. We've been talking today about one billion years, or, or I was saying, okay, this is a smaller scale, it's probably half a million years. And that was for me a um, smaller scale. Um, in connection with that, uh, the notion of our present challenges with climate change, okay? We have to understand from a, um, from a deep time perspective as well, uh, extinctions, uh, mass extinctions. Uh, if you think that um, some of the, um, the, 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 the increased temperature because of CO2 in the case of the end Permian mass extinction or, or some of the other extinctions that were uh, shortly before and shortly afterwards the end Permian mass extinction, they may work as with, 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 some, with a lot of adjustment as good analogs or sources of information to our present challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, because we, we are looking at things from a temporal perspective at the larger scale that we cannot do in the modern. So I think that uh, the field can illuminate on many different issues. We need to be able to explain that um, uh, because... Uh, so is the funding mostly government? Is it mostly government funding? Are there climate change yeah. consortiums that are funding a lot of this? Or uh, no, uh, the, the funding agencies is, for example, in Canada, it's uh, NSERC. It's um, the Research Council, the Canadian Research Council, is funding um, a lot. Um, it's like a basic science uh, foundation of some sort. Basic science, and it has changed through 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 time the priorities. But I, I would say that. A, a lot of what is being done, most of what is being done in paleobiology, uh, it's funded by, by NSERC in Canada. In the US will be National Science Foundation, but then there are programs by NASA. Mm. Uh, the mm. For like astrobiology, program, yeah. The astrobiology program, which has some connect connections with Precambrian issues. Mm. Then historically, uh, a lot of geologists, particularly those working with sedimentary rocks, they've been employed by the petroleum industry. I mean, that has been the history of sedimentary rocks and sedimentology. But, you know, now it's uh, the situation that has changed completely. Yeah. The, it's not looking too bright. It, no, it's, it's clearly it's, it's, it's not. So, uh, but on the other hand, um, there are resources that we have to use, uh, starting with water that are preserved in, in sedimentary rocks. So there is always an applied site for um, those doing sedimentology. Are you, are you planning on applying for a geology grant? Or do you? <laughs> I'm just I'm very interested in like how humans pick what to spend their scientific yeah. money on, you know? Because yeah. uh, obviously like anybody who can immediately instrumentalize some knowledge, like say a pharmaceutical company or a rocket company or something like that, they're probably uh, going to be able to lobby and drive the research yeah. money over in that direction a little bit better than somebody who's like, well, it's just important because we got to yeah. know how things went down in order to yeah. not screw up the next time around, you know? And Yeah, yeah. No, you're totally right. I mean, and, and the big money is in terms of uh, funding. It's in other fields. And that's also something that plays a role in terms of priorities because... Um, uh, institutions, they like to get big grants. Mm, they are scientists getting big grants. So, um, and in, in that sense, what, what we do is, 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 is we, we work with much less funding. And it, it helps me understand the like monolithic focus on climate change in global politics and media too a little bit better because this is the closest thing, climate change is the closest thing to a pandemic that the geologists have, or natural scientists, or like natural historians, people who are looking at the deep past. The it's closest thing to a pandemic in the sense of a single unifying rallying cry? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's, it's a very good analogy. I mean, because it's a huge challenge, and it's kind of, it's the pandemic uh, multiplied, and, you know, to another order of magnitude in a way. It's, uh, it's and, and, and you get, you get actually kind of shocked that it's not be, it's not in the media even more. I mean, we are we are kind of not talking about that. 
Um, Which is bizarre because it's clear, like, when you look at the history of the Earth, that it's been through insane climate changes, like just wild swings of climate. Like, this is a feature, not a bug. Like, the climate is definitely changing. It's always been changing. Like, even if humans were saintly... And so let's say that we do fix the the emissions and we fix the pollution and we learn to manage our resources and we become sort of a closed cycle society, no waste. We still haven't dealt with the fact that the planet is going to change dramatically underneath our feet, right? Like you get snowball earth, you get hothouse earth, yes. like things change. Yes. So this is the problem of the time temporal frame. Sure. You know? Of course. It's uh, the, 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 and the, what we are generating right now, it's, it's the rate of change. Mm. So what is absolutely amazing because even in the mass extinctions, when we talk about the rapid mass extinctions, they are of temporal frameworks that are much, much higher than mm. what we see right now in terms of the the, 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 the the climate change that we are experiencing already. And and the and, and the and the, the, the way uh, this is changing because I mean if some decades ago, we were talking about okay, the future generations. You know, it was kind of a, in the long in the long run. Now, isn't no, not anymore. I mean, this is right here. I mean, the rivers are emptied of fish, and the oceans are sick, and it's like, yeah. I you know, you you listen to accounts of uh, we live in the Pacific Northwest, and so I was reading Lewis and Clark's accounts of coming down oh, the Columbia. Yeah. And, you know, the stories that they tell of the fish runs and the way that the, the rivers are alive. You go to the rivers now and you're like, well, there's a murky pool of water with some scum floating on it. I guess that's alive. Yes. Yes. And so it's yes. like, I think that it's, I think that what you're saying is that if you look in the geologic record, there's, you know, tens of thousands of years over the course of which things disappear. The idea that things disappear over 200 years is insane. That's that's, That's what is extremely scary. That this is one of the the lessons that I think we may get. The second one is the the, the problem of the feedbacks. You know, mm. the self propagating mechanisms. Uh, you go to to study some of the mass extinctions, and you arrive, you realize, okay, there was a volcanic eruption that triggered certain change and that in terms amplify the effects and at some point you get some of those spillover points beyond which the system is acting in a completely crazy way and you cannot predict what's going to happen after those inflection points mm -hmm. and i think that that's also something that the temporal perspective of geology can provide us mm. the, the this issue of, of feedbacks um, and, and, and when you think, okay, in, in what happened in, in Western Canada this, this year, the, the, the issue of the heat dome mm, last summer, which is apparently, I mean, it's not my field, but apparently based on what I have read, uh, cannot be explained based on modern climatic models. Mm. Uh, these kind of things. Okay. What happened when we move into a time or a, or a stage that we cannot explain based on the or predict based on the present models. And I use a lot as analogy actually what happened during the Precambrian Cambrian transition. Because Dolph Seilacher, the same German scientist that I mentioned for the idea on the on the affinities of the diagram by Yoda, he has a very useful concept that is called the agronomic revolution. Okay? And the agronomic revolution he's making an analogy with uh, changes related with plugging in agriculture. And he's saying, okay, if you look at the diacaran and you have those microbial mass sealing the surface of the sediment from the water column, and then you move into the Cambrian, animals start to burrow down. That's kind of the analogy with the plugging of the sediment. That's what we call the agronomic revolution and it's creating a whole new world. And my analogy, if you go back in time and you are they are standing in shallow water in the diacaran, and you look at the sutra, you, you would be unable to predict what's coming next. Because what happened is actually a spillover point, a point in the history where the interactions change, the rules change completely. Mm -hmm. And you move into, uh, it's not that there are simply innovations, it's that you move into a different world. And that's kind of the, point. yeah, and that's the, that's the wild thing about about living in a time where the models shift, where yes. it's we we as scientists, 
I think we spend a lot of time building models and we look at this window of the world and we put something together and we say that this is this is going to have predictive power, but that predictive power is only possible if you have parameterized it correctly and you cannot parameterize it correctly if your parameters are going to change massively over the course of a relatively small window. And they start to interact among mm, themselves mm -hmm. and they move into a completely new stage. So I use a lot in class the agronomic revolution as an analogy for the anthropos, hmm. which may come out of weird because let's say you are doing a class lecture on, on the anthropocene and suddenly you go back to the Precambrian Cambrian boundary. But it actually works pretty well. Very cool. Because if you think, for example, trailing of the ocean by the fishing industry, mm -hmm. okay, well, it's what we are doing with the bottom of the oceans is what animals did at, during the Cambrian during the Diakar and Cambrian transition hundreds of millions of years ago. And we are changing completely the dynamics of the sediment and the ecosystems by doing that. And on top of that, if we move into really deep waters, deep water ecosystems, because everything is a slow pace, it takes much more time to, 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 to recover. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's uh, quite complicated. Um, so what, you get, what, yeah. what you're saying is that it, human sized trilobites within the next <laughs> 500 million yeah. years? Yeah, we are the worms. Yeah. <laughs> we, are, we, we like to say that the, we are the bioturbators. Yeah. yeah, that's, uh, um, that's the, the, one of the, the, the things that we like to say in our, in our research group. Yeah. Oh, this, has been, this has been very fascinating. Thank you. No, thank you for having me. It was uh, great to be able to share a little bit what we do. Yeah, I think it's super valuable, and I, I really look forward to the evolution of our understanding about the deep past, because a lot of things are making more sense, but there's still so many pieces that just don't add up to me, and so I'll be, I'll be very curious how the yeah. next... Yeah, no, no, next I completely will. agree. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Botois. It's been really fun to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.